what made you as a marketing manager to come up with a podcast as a format? Everybody thinks, and it's a normal perception for everybody to think that podcasts are basically there only for the creators, for the bloggers, and for the individuals, right? So companies don't usually look at it. But I believe that companies should look at that. And I think it was one of those things that I wanted to convince my organization and my leaders to do because podcasts are basically uh, are like crock pot of content. They're very tailored, very personalized, dynamic, and you can play around with it so much. Was there any specific uh, sort of strategy that you took that helped you to change the conversation? We're going to, uh, let's say, record a set of interviews that we call a podcast. You have to to show your management a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. For them, a podcast might mean something and for you, a podcast might mean something else as a marketeer. Interesting. You see a sea of opportunities that you can do. You can do trailers, you can do, you know, uh, context-driven podcasts, interviews and testimonials. So you have this wide range of ideas while the management might not see it that way, right? You can have a meaningful conversation with a client. You can have, you can do client testimonials. Um, you can speak to your potential clients clients about problems and solutions that you can come up together with. How soon did you get the buying? I wish to say I was a superwoman and I convinced them from the first try. When it comes to planning a podcast for a B2B yeah. space, let's be honest, it's not always a low maintenance job. If we're doing something different, what do we want our people to go and search for in the Google search? Tell me something real. <laughs> tell me something that, you know, would help me. Tell me tell me that you screwed up at some point. A lot of B2B companies are not going into any new format and stay with something that works and stay in that safe place because the branding aspect plays a huge role in it, meaning any wrong conversation, any wrong perception can impact the brand that they were building and investing in for many, many years. So how did you ensure that that aspect is safe and covered? Imagine your podcast um, or your brand is a song, right? Your podcast, I guess, should be the acoustic version of your brand. Hello everyone, welcome to On Speaking Terms, which is a B2B podcast channel. Today we're having Christina from Jellyfy. Uh, she, a special fact about Christina is that she was born and raised in Dubai, built her brilliant marketing career in Dubai, and she's also at the heart of her, her company's very first business podcast, which is called Purple Podcast which is also recorded at Potsdam Studio. We're going to talk about B2B podcasts today and ever-evolving B2B content marketing. Welcome, welcome, Christina, and please tell us a little more about yourself and your company. Thanks, Laura, for the introduction. Well, as you mentioned, yes, um, I've been working with Jellify for the past three years since their inception here in the Middle East. And we came up with the idea of forming the podcast, which is called The Purple Podcast at the beginning of this year. Um, it was quite an exciting journey, quite a lengthy journey to arrive to, but we have done it. And I'm here again to talk about it with you today. Lovely. So, uh, so if we jump straight away into podcasting, yes, um, I was going to ask you a lot about marketing, but I think this conversation will just pop up while we speak. Of course. Uh, so uh, what made you, what made you create podcasts? Because, you know, when I uh, sort of came across the Purple Podcast and then I was like, okay, uh, the Purple Podcast recorded uh, and it seems to be like a B2B podcast that I'm not aware about. And then I uh, came across your profile. I realized that you're a marketing manager. I'm like, okay, so I definitely need to reach out and ask. So what made you as a marketing manager to come up with a podcast as a format? Um, well, I mean, as marketeers, we always think uh, that podcasts are a nice and cool thing to have, but 
the managers or the companies usually don't like that. Everybody thinks, and it's a normal perception for everybody to think that podcasts are basically there only for the creators, for the bloggers and for the individuals, right? So companies don't usually look at it. But I believe that companies should look at that. And I think it was one of those things that I want to convince my organization and my leaders to do because podcasts are basically uh, are like crockpot of content. They're very tailored, very personalized, dynamic, and you can play around with it so much. And I believe they're very low maintenance. They're not those lengthy, boring reports that you as an organization need to do with a lot of research behind it, with a lot of approvals. And uh, yeah, low maintenance, and you can tune in whatever you want on the go. And that's just the type of content that you need to produce in the 21st century to be relevant, right? What? Uh, uh, no, I absolutely agree with you. And so I think we're on the same page uh, in terms of how we look at podcasting. And I also, you nailed it. So companies usually think that this is something that is not for organizations. This is yeah. something that uh, can only be done by individuals, for example, or a branded, a somewhat we call a branded podcast. I don't know, this is either something not to be listened or whatever. I mean, there are so many bias and uh, misconceptions about what is a branded podcast. Uh, so do you, what kind of, let's say, what kind of benefits do you see for the organizations who are creating the branded podcasts? What benefits, straightaway benefits do you see? I think it's a way to showcase your organization in a different light. I mean, it's a very creative type of content that you can produce. And it's not necessarily only speaking about you as an organization, what services you provide. It's speaking to your audiences and it allows your audience to engage with you, right? So doing a podcast, it's not necessarily you um, as a company owner or as a company representative, keep on talking, and educating people about your services or products or whatever. You can have a meaningful conversation with a client. You can have, you can do client testimonials. Um, you can speak to your potential clients about problems and solutions that you can come up together with. I mean, there's a wide range of things that you could do with podcasts. It's very individual and it's very, I think, easy to navigate and low to maintain in terms of um, you don't need a tons of research. You're just speaking to a person that would either buy your service or the person that could help you to produce a product or a service. And that's great. And, and you produce the podcast and it's just out there. People can tune in from the comfort of their home while they're jogging. I personally listen to podcasts when I drive to work or when I do house chores as a boring as it sounds for, for some, but I like to listen to that. I do motivational podcasts when I do house chores. Oh yeah. Not, might not necessarily be business, but these podcasts, these type of content, you can really tune in at any time and engage with the audience that you want to engage with. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I uh, agree with you about uh, the multiple ways you, first of all, you can consume podcasts yeah. and then the multiple ways you can use your podcast, your initial set of recording within the organization. Yeah. So you as a marketing manager decided uh, that your company needs a podcast. Yeah. So what was your next step? So did you come to the management and say, so look, we need a podcast. So how did that work? Did you create a business case? A uh, business case, sort of, yeah. But also it was more of like being rigid. I mean, the management, some like side of the management saw the need of that. They were on the same side of understanding that, yes, we need to be in the space of, you know, creating video and audio content. But other side of the management was uh, not really quite understanding why do we need that form? What, what are we getting out of that? Uh, just the views and stuff? No, we need to sell our services. We need to sell things, right? So what's the immediate tangible return? So it was quite hard for them to understand. But the reality is, hey guys, we live in 21st century. Uh, we live in the digital economy. We live in the world of creative economy, where if you're not covering all your bases uh, on the digital platforms and you're not speaking about what you do, how you do things differently in different types and different content manners, 
then what are you even doing? I mean, we work as a, as a company, we are operating in a tech space. So we need to cover all of our bases, whether it's a written format content, visual content, audio content, we need to spread that message. Why are we different? Why are we do what we do? What do we have to offer uh, as a community of innovators and, and other things like that? So that was the first thing. What are we doing if we're not doing podcasts? It's the 21st century and the podcast is not some dirty word that, you know, we're not allowed to pronounce. It's something that we need to be doing as a business. It's no longer only for the individuals. So that was one thing. But of course, as in, in any marketer in business uh business operating in a business you need to give some tangible numbers so there was some research some benchmarks done some some let's say talking like hey our competitors are doing a podcast we're not why so it triggers them as well but um again i think the most in the for, uh, the forefront was we are in the digital economy why we're not doing a podcast was there any specific uh, sort of strategy that you took that helped you to change the conversation from why are we not uh, just invest in, in investing, let's say, uh, in an event or, let's say, a keynote on the conference? And instead of that, we're going to, uh, let's say, record a set of interviews that we call a podcast. How did you change that conversation or did you have to change or are you sort of managing to integrate both? Well, see... Um when you, I guess as a marketeer, when you introduce the topic of let's do a podcast, you have to show your management a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. For them, a podcast might mean something. And for you, a podcast might mean something else as a marketeer. Interesting. You see a sea of opportunities that you can do. You can do trailers, you can do, you know, a context driven podcasts, interviews and testimonials. So you have this wide range of ideas while the management might not see it that way. Right. So you have to show them the bigger your picture and you show you show have to show them the future opportunities because as i said podcast is a crock pot of content it's a low maintenance type of content it's not something that you need to constantly update constantly maintain you produced a nice well-versed episode uh whatever type it was that you decided on and it lives there on your social platforms on on your social media on your website on the uh, podcast channels forever. People can tune in three to four years later. And if your topic is still relevant, you're there. You're still there, right? So you're, you're there as a constant reminder. You're there as an educator or as a front forefront of any other topic that you were talking about. So that was the thing. Show them the bigger picture, show them the opportunities. It might bring clients, it might bring brand awareness and wide range of things. So show them that. How soon did you get the buying? Like from the first conversation or did you have to come back to this conversation several times to be able to get that budget or was it like an easy uh, easy way or did you have to let's say okay let's not invest into that event this year but instead let's do the podcast um i wish to say i was a superwoman and i convinced them from the first try Good. but no <laughs> it did not work like that unfortunately um in in my head it was cooking up for let's not even in my head i, I mean in my plan it was cooking up for a year but i think it took a couple of months to convince them and uh, we decided at the end of last year that this is something we're going to give a try mm -hmm. and we did give it a try this year we're at the at the verge of recording uh, our other episodes so we're also kind of like seeing how it works out maybe the management might not see again the results right away but you show them the bigger picture what it would look like for you in six months in a year, in two years, and how would it would impact your brand? Because at the end of the day, not everything you do when it comes to marketing or content creation is about selling, right? So you have to show them a range of things that it brings to you as an organization. Well, there's like a ratio, frankly speaking, that 90% of the content that you're creating is basically entertaining or educational, and only 10% has to be dedicated to sort of selling or driving some sort yeah. of, uh, you know, direct action uh, from what you're creating. And then you create that type of loyalty that yeah. keeps your audience with your brand or with you as an, as an individual. Correct. Uh, my question was, uh, uh, I wanted to return back a little bit to your low maintenance kind yeah. of part, because Yes, we know that uh, 
it is a lower maintenance than, for example, uh, let's say prepare an event or something like that. Probably it's something that is lower maintenance than, let's say, create a proper or conduct a proper research or something. But when it comes to planning a podcast for a B2B yeah. space, let's be honest, it's not always a low maintenance job. No, planning is not at all. <laughs> so I want to, um, I want to ask you, so how did you come to a, a format? How was the hosting? Uh, so how was like the process of selecting a host and then contacting the guests and then yeah. allocating a topic? Do you script or you don't script your podcast? Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, it's still a very exciting process as much yeah. as it is not low maintenance in my opinion, but it's a very exciting process to do. Well, um, let's start with the fact that it's, it is my first podcast as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a professional podcast producer or anything like that. So it had to start with me. I had to go out there. I had to look for the podcast, how they were done. Um, what are our competitors doing? How to create an interesting podcast? What length does it have to be? What format does it have to be? What formats are there? What podcast uh, platforms are there? I mean, because uh, again, uh, I was only aware of Spotify and Apple, and then I discovered that Google has podcasts, for example. I was Which not aware of that. Which is disappearing next year, by the way. So oh, yeah. they're, they're eliminating the Google podcast, but let's not get into okay. that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I had to discover a lot of things for myself first before I went to the team and say, okay, here, here, this is what we have. This is what we can do. Now let's think. So I was there passing the way of, okay, we have a podcast. This is the things that we can do. Now let's think with what you guys are able to help me with to do. So who can be a host? So obviously we had to chose a well-spoken person from our organization, the person that's not camera shy, the person that is pre like preferably not scripted. It's very hard to host a podcast when a person prefers to have everything scripted, to, you know, to read everything. Um, it's quite difficult to manage those kind of people. And um, I mean, the podcast is not natural. You want the podcast to be natural, flowy, engagement. It's like a free conversation, just like what we're having between me and you and right now. I mean, if it was scripted, I, I don't think anybody would probably tune in and be like, oh no, they're doing a, another scripted version. I'm not interested to hear how, what this guy is reading from the paper. So that was one. Then um, you had to understand, okay, now that we have a podcast, what are we actually doing? Are we talking about our organization only or like, are we creating a platform? Are we educating our people? Are we educating our people about something um, that we sell or are, do we give the voice to our customers to to talk about how we sell and what we sold them and how amazing we are? So a lot of things came into thought. And then at the end of the day, we were like, okay, we, we call ourselves an innovation company or an innovation factory, right? So what what are we bringing there? What are we bringing new that's not out there? We don't want to sound like other podcasts or as uh, uh, other competitors that we have and do the same podcast with the same narrative. No, we don't want to do that. And when we were designing Purple Podcast, we said, let's call it a platform mm -hmm. rather than just a podcast channel. It's a platform for us to speak to other innovators in the industry and not to uh, for them to showcase themselves, right? Or it's more about... To, to connect to people and to bring people on our podcast that are able to share valuable insights about things that went wrong when they were doing innovation, about things that they learned and they're willing to share. We don't want another person that comes up, up to us and say, oh, we did this great innovation. We created this and we are amazing. No, we don't want that. We want to engage our audience. And we, when, I, when we thought about our audience, we're like, who are we attracting with these type of speakers? The audience that we chose, of course, the first segment was, um, who, who are you selling to as your business, right? And, and you have your audience. But the second part was like, if we're doing something different, what do we want our people to go and search for in the Google search? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was the idea that we said that it's, shit, I failed at something. I wonder if somebody did something different in when it came to innovation, innovation in this sphere or in this industry. Was there a use case? Did somebody experience what I experienced? Or 
how did they do it differently? And that's the type of questions that we want to answer with our podcast or our platform. So a lot of thinking behind went to it. It was not an easy one. <laughs> thinking behind it and uh, originating the idea was not the easy one. But once you know what your aim is and once you know what kind of people you want to invite and what kind of people you want to tune in to your podcast, it kind of flows naturally because at the end of the day, uh, you're, you have a vision, right? That's true. That's true. So were you pressured uh, to create something that monetizes straight away? I know a lot of creators, a lot of podcasters <laughs> who start, they either pressure themselves or they're pressured by their sponsors to monetize almost from day one, which I think is impossible uh, when it comes to direct sales or direct opportunities. You can literally talk about any types of tangible numbers performance based assessment after episode 40 probably anything before that pays back in a different way exactly well that's that's from my experience were you pressured to present something tangible from uh day one well um and how did you overcome that yes say thankfully not but again that I think that ties back to the first question that you asked me, how did you convince your management and what did you say? How do, how do you show them the bigger picture, right? Yeah. You have to say it from the very beginning that when you ask for a podcast, you ask for the budget, you have to visualize the, the return for them. And, and it's not necessarily going to be immediate client knocking on your doors and things like that. At the end of the day, we are in the B2B space, right? We are not in the B2C, which is a different story. So you have to manage the expectations, right? Uh, you have to sell them the idea of your first 10 episodes will probably contribute to your brand awareness, probably will contribute to building a wider network um, of people that you know you could potentially convert into clients maybe a year or two later again. So there's layers of things that go into that so you have to manage the expectations from the very beginning um was there a question how do we monetize it and how soon and things like that yes there was but that's again you manage the expectations right uh yes yeah, so, but i uh, yeah let's talk about uh, probably performance and the way you let's say l you're, you're planning to promote your podcast mm -hmm. uh s slightly later um just to sort of to complete the the planning process uh conversation so how, how did you ensure uh that the podcast that you're creating mm -hmm. uh, with all the creativity and all the thinking behind and all the innovation aspect and all the innovation vision that comes with it, how did you ensure that is not damaging or is not impacting your brand identity? Let's put it this way. Because what I know, a lot of B2B companies are not going into any new format and stay with something that works and stay in that safe place because the branding aspect plays a huge role in it. Meaning any wrong conversation, any wrong perception can impact the brand that they were building and investing in for many, many years. Yeah. So how did you ensure that that aspect is safe and covered? Ah, that's a tough one as well. <laughs> so um, when, again, when it was, uh, we were in the thought process of at the podcast, um, I thought of it, or I think um, of a podcast is, imagine your podcast um, or your brand is a song, right? Your podcast, I guess, should be the acoustic version of your brand. It should not be exactly the same should not, you know, 100% align with everything that is on your website or is in your brochures or whatever you have as a marketing collateral. But it should have the same ethos and the main idea behind it. So uh, even though when we were creating the, the podcast, the idea behind it or what we're doing with our episode is not, episodes is not necessarily what we do as a business in terms of does not reflect maybe our products or services or things like that. But 
the main idea behind it is that we take a topic and we give it like an innovation zest, a sprinkle. We are an innovation company and we take that topic and we flavor it in, with our brand, branded identity, right? So we named it The Purple Podcast mm-hmm. for a reason. To many people, and as a, let's say, uh, it would not resonate. What do you mean by purple? Purple actually for our organization means um, the way that we conduct business. So we we say that the purple way is to endorse the human genius, is to be agile, to be fresh and stay innovative. And that's why we call the podcast, the Purple Podcast. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that we might talk about various topics. We might bring different ideas. Our Even our episodes might have different, uh, let's say, flavors to it. But the idea is always to talk about that topic in a fresh, agile, and a human-centered way. So each podcast and each episode is designed with this in mind. And that's why we call it the Purple Podcast. And it's also kind of like our marketing technique when we talk about the Purple Way. Do you have to get through uh, like a number of different internal PR approvals before you go into a recording? Or is it something that uh, sort of is simplified within your organization? Um, I wish to say it was simplified, but I I do carry um, a global role. So I have a certain seniority, let's say. So I have only a couple of people to talk about this with. So that kind of helps me out a lot, right? It gives me that freedom and flexibility of quickly ideating the next episode with my team and who's going to be speaking and what topic are we tackling and what format is going to be. And then we just have to kind of knock off the idea with other two, two, two or three people that are involved, and that's about it. So there's it. no PR involved talking about, like, uh, probably sort of mentioning that these words cannot be used and everything. So you, you're not dealing with, let's say, the uh, the wording side of things. So certain things can be said and certain things cannot be mentioned. Are you dealing with those kind of approvals? Um, no, because our podcast is. Um, Let's say we're not talking about ourselves right, as a company. We are bringing other people that share our voice, share our insights and and talk about things that went wrong. We, we don't want our podcast to sound very, as I said, scripted. Don't say this, don't say that, don't say the bad things that happened. Don't mention the failures that you went through or hurdles that you, you know, you witnessed and things like that. No, be free, talk. Uh, tell us how your story went because we want people to be able to connect with that because if everything is perfect and you're the best and um, you know you use certain words to say things that's when it's scripted that's when people cannot relate be like oh that again another podcast everything is great everything is amazing they're the best and you're like tell me something real <laughs> tell me something that you know would help me tell me tell me that you screwed up at some point because i did right now and i'm looking for help and i and your episode is supposed to kind of teach me what went wrong and how to avoid that so I, yeah so it's you, you're not you're not trying to be perfect in your podcast no we're not at but then all. i have another question okay say so, uh if from your side for example uh so that's that's kind of your strategy, your marketing technique. You talk the purple way, which allows you that space yeah. for innovation, for that free flow of conversation, which is great. But when it comes to your guests, yeah. and especially when you are, let's say, talking to some, uh, let's say, higher profiles guests, mm-hmm. how do you deal with their PR teams then in this case? So, um, again, you need to manage expectations, right? <laughs> I keep saying that, but it's it's true. Um, we say it straight away that we want to hear the real stories. We want to hear the struggles. We want you to be your authentic self and represent, either you represent your organization or not, but you need to be authentic and say things how they are, right? So if um, at some point it's a high profile person and they cannot s- you know, say certain things, we can align on that, yes. But also the idea behind it is that 
if if you're not sharing anything interesting and if you're not sharing something that people can learn from, we usually, I mean, those are the, the people in our target to have it as part of our podcast. So we manage risks, we manage things accordingly with their PR teams, but we kind of put it in their face. These, This is our expectations of what is going to be mentioned. If you're aligned with that, great. If not, um, uh, we're, we're just being very straightforward. We don't think this initiative is for you. Thank you. But we want you to be honest. We want you to be authentic. How easy or difficult is it for you uh, to find uh, the guests for your podcast? Well, I mean, it's... Um, it's quite, I would say it's 50-50, right? So uh, it comes down to the fact that we are, we are very open in our podcast. Some people are okay with that and they're willing to share their um, struggles and things like that. Some people are not and it might become, you know, harder for, the, for their organizations, their PR team and marketing. So in the beginning, obviously, we tapped into our network, whether it was existing clients or people, new people. So it was more of like, oh, I know that person. I know that person is going to be willing to share his story. And that person is great. And that person is very authentic in what he's going to say. So we started with our network. And then it was, I guess it was just a word of mouth. I mean, mm. it was like, because we in, in Dubai, I mean, the innovators community uh, or tech community is quite small. I mean, everybody says that Dubai is big, but it kind of feels small already. But the innovation community is even smaller. So word of mouth works wonders. Very, yeah, very yeah. much, yeah. So it went to, to word of mouth and then obviously the, the whole advertisement and kind of people kind of trying to resonate with the fact that, oh yeah, they're doing something different. They're not just inviting people to talk about, hey, how great I am. Hey, we did this and we did great. And, you know, it was amazing. No, we did this and we screwed up so many times and this is what went wrong and this is what went wrong. So people resonated with that and they're like, I, I can do that too. I can share my story like that. Uh, how, uh, how do you think you're going to promote your podcast? Uh, not necessarily like but pay that is probably yes. But how do you think you're going to promote it to to get those, you know, tangible views, downloads, listenership, audience growth, things like that? Just for us to cover that aspect, which is not my favorite, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> but we do know we need to have the numbers. We need to have the numbers, indeed. I mean, it all starts with your digital and social channels, of course. And I think... The most important thing that I learned when doing a podcast is that you can never have enough trailers. Oh, so no. Yeah. <laughs> you need <laughs> the trailers. Teasers, teasers, teasers trailers, yeah, yeah. teasers, trailers. If you can get a hundred of them from one episode, great. Do that because those are the small things that whether you're putting them on reels, on TikTok, whatever your business is present. Are you they guys do doing wonders. TikTok? Uh, are you doing Instagram? We don't do TikTok. Our audience is not there, but we do reels on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, we do Facebook Facebook reels. We uh, do the trailers on LinkedIn, which is a, our major B2B audience, right? right? So those things work wonders. Yeah. I mean, people get snapped on your 10 second uh, of content. But, oh, I want to hear what they have to say. Oh, that was interesting. And you kind of like select the most interesting moments or like screw up moments or like shocking moments from the, the episode. And people are like, oh, I want to see that. And you can even um, put it as part of your email marketing campaign, right? Th those videos that would people can quickly play or you can turn your trailers into memes we did that no that i would. yeah that is absolutely fantastic i think uh, uh the, the memes i'm a big fan of anything that can make a b2b content a little yeah a little more exciting than exactly. it's been there for years uh but i what i find uh with what you call trailers i call them teasers, teasers. uh what i find uh great about them i think the audience appreciates the job that you're doing for them because not everyone has got 40 minutes Listen to watch to yeah. a B2B podcast. Yeah. Do you yeah. agree? And it's not an easy thing to listen to a B2B content, which is a 40 minutes long. But at yeah. the same time, for example, what I face when I record B2B content, so you're bringing a high profile guest 
there's no way you can record for 15 minutes and stop, right? You utilize that hour and you record as much as possible. And you do realize that no one is going to listen to probably for one hour episode. But what you do later on, you are creating those short snippets or extractions yeah. from that video that help the audience to get the, the, the main messages around what you were talking about. And I think that's what audience appreciates a lot, especially on LinkedIn. So that's why trailers are so a popular. Lot. Correct, correct. I, f I feel like those snippets and trailers and teasers, as you call them, they do wonders. And I mean, a collection of those, even, I mean, you can align them in a way that it kind of turns into a five minute episode for someone to watch and kind of get the idea. If they want to tune in later, they get to tune in later. And uh, another point of how do you market uh, the podcast? You can repurpose your podcast into a blog post. You can repurpose it into an article, taking a different angle or taking a very small narrative from the same episode you produce. And that's, again, if you had a guest, that's another co-marketing opportunity. They can even add up to that thought and you can link it, link your podcast episode. You can link your a trailer or a snippet to it. So there is like multiple ways of promoting and none of them actually have to be paid apart from the digital marketing. That's true. So what I like about this conversation is just it's finally changing because I remember probably five, six years ago when we were listening to Gary Vee. I'm not sure if you, of if you know that. Yeah, of so course. like our podcast guru back in the days, like, I mean, probably the guy is talking about podcasts for 10 years now, right? But, uh, and talking about the media company and the media brand back then. But we're seeing finally now in our region, this conversation started to change. Uh, so, companies started to get that grip that yes, yes, you are recording one interview, you're repurposing it in multiple hundred different times and you can use that message, you can use that insight as your company's insight for like years ahead. Uh, yeah, I like the change of the conversation. So if we look at your marketing in general, what else are you guys doing apart from the podcast as a marketing team? What are you doing uh, in the region? What are the interesting things that probably other marketers can learn from you? I mean, um, there's so many things that you could do, right? But uh, the most important, I think for this region, the most important things are events. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess in the past year, if not a bit more, I would say, we moved quite away from the webinars. I feel like this region no longer appreciates webinars. It's more about the physical events. It's more about you know, the, the actual connection that you create during a physical event. It could, so we run small workshops, we run small, small scale events. It doesn't have to be massive. The more intimate event, the better it is. People actually can communicate with one another, engage and kind of form, let's say a circle. An event of 10 people, as maybe it's as silly as it sounds for some organizations, works much better than 100 people at that same event when it feels overwhelming. So events uh, is our go-to. Uh, we also do have uh, our Innovators Guild or Innovators Club. Again, it's a small scare, scale club for innovators in the region where they can freely exchange um, and kind of bounce off ideas of one another, talk about struggles, but behind the it, scenes, yeah. behind the scenes. I no, mean, I like it. I like it that you are actually having the aspect. I call it a community, probably not yeah. a huge, but a it's small a community, community of yeah. people who can talk about things that they're struggling with, probably yeah. without, you know, people uh, watching, seeing, listening, just a very close people yeah. of, uh, you know, a very close ecosystem that can talk about things that yeah. bother them and, every day. And to be very honest, it started with a very, you know, with the idea of like even hosting like small dinners. And after a couple of them, we started that during COVID and it, we started it online, of course, because of all the restrictions. But once we moved it offline and people started engaging, I mean, we, we thought that it would be take max an hour for five people to connect, talk. But people kept on talking. People are like... I struggle with this. Oh, I did that. And this what worked for me and this what not worked for me. Oh, let's try something like that. There are business ideas that are born between those people as well. They might be from completely different companies and these companies might merge for a business idea. So the, the small community of, you know, hosting those small scale events create wonders, really. 
So since we are in uh, October now, yeah. right? Uh, 2023 is almost over. So what are your predictions for the next year from marketing perspective, from podcast perspective? What do you think you're going to keep? What are you going to discontinue as a marketing manager, as a marketing team? Uh, well, of course, podcast. We're going to keep the podcast. So what we personally learned from our audience is uh, when we were doing podcasts is that they prefer much shorter versions of the podcast. So we're going to delve into a series of short, shorter episodes, right? Uh, so video content, audio content, king of the content in 2024, 100%. Small scale events, something we call it quick and dirty, something that you don't have to plan a year in advance and market six months in advance for 100 people to attend your event and massive, uh, you know, um, money from your fund. No, you don't, we don't do that. We do quick things, tangible things and things that work. And social media is obviously digital marketing, all your video, audio content, those are going to be the keys. And when it comes to, I would say, downloadable content, it's your PDFs, your eBooks and things like that. I think there is also a trend that people no longer prefer to have that long written content research. People want snippets of things. They want information to be consumed fast. People are on the go. There, there's tons of information around. So you have to make sure that whatever you market next year is very compact very straight to the point and kind of holds your brand essence and what what's different about you. Otherwise, you're just going to get lost in tons of marketing content that's already out there. So the marketing jobs are becoming tougher and tougher from that perspective. Tougher and tougher. I <laughs> but mean, more exciting at the same time. Imagine yeah. how crisp and clear marketers should become, like managing to create that content and also make that content consumable make that content yeah. attractive for your audience it's not just creation it's also you know selling that content and behind that you need to convince your managers uh your leadership team why this is how you should uh really, they yeah. should be doing it yeah but, so, also, but i mean that yeah. makes marketers even smarter and i don't know brilliant but, people. Yeah. but also i mean thanks ai Thank you, ChatGPT. Thank you, all the AI generative tools that are out there. Because in 2024, if you are a marketing person and you're not utilizing generative AI as part of your job, you're getting lost. You're getting lost in tons of content. And tools like that really help you kind of uh, like be more operational, be more efficient and more productive. Uh, creativity, I'm not sure about that yet. I feel like I feel like those tools help you from, you know, being faster and efficient, but creativity wise, you, you're still the human, you're still the genius behind every brand and every campaign and every innovation that goes out there. So utilize those tools still. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think chat GPT, frankly, is a game changer. Oh, Especially for those who are in content, it's a game changer from the perspective that you can, at least you can have, finally, you can have you can have a tool that help you think together and yeah. come up with ideas, probably with some weddings. I mean, there's nothing wrong about... I, absolutely. You know, and integrating absolutely. it. It makes you produce things much faster than it used to be. Absolutely. And it's not only for marketeers. I feel like it's for everyone. It helps you to be efficient, quicker, work smarter. It's not about... It's not about AI taking your job or your creativity away. No, it helps you to facilitate. It collaborates with you. And if you give it pro proper prompts and if you have a certain criteria in mind and you know where you're going, you can do magic with it, literally. I agree with you, Christina. I would continue this conversation for hours because I can talk marketing <laughs> and content for hours because there's so many topics that uh, I like talking about with smart marketers like you. I wish you a very best luck with your The Purple podcast and uh, Jellyfy and hopefully we can come across in this studio again and again. And thank you very much for being on Speaking Terms. Our episode with Christina talking about B2B podcasts and marketing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Ciao, ciao.